Well, happy Valentine's Day class. And we're talking about the heart. It's perfect. Um, before you see this, you should uh, see much longer lecture on the heart anatomy, and then an in-person lecture on ECG, some functioning of the heart. Today, this short lecture will be on uh, blood vessels conceptually. And then um, I'll have an in-person lecture on uh, blood pressure and issues. And then a last lecture online on, uh, we'll go through the blood vessels, the anatomy, the major blood vessels of your body pretty much. That's the plan. All right. All right, so your cardiovascular system is your heart and your blood vessels that are gonna propel your blood through your body to every nook and cranny. So vessels is a general term, it can be arteries or veins or capillaries, anything like that. So blood vessel just encompasses them all. And <clears throat> we have these flexible um, vessels in our body, unlike the, uh, the vessels in your house, which are uh, PVC or copper pipes. Uh, I guess there's PEX tubing, which can, with kind of plasticky, they can withstand some flexing. But heart vessels are um, definitely uh, flexible. And you can feel, as you feel your pulse, you feel your artery, your radial artery is expanding, <clears throat> coming back like a rubber band. Yeah. And uh, uh, we have a closed circulatory system. Remember from biology class, uh, lobster and, uh, you know, flatworm, they don't have an open circulatory system where in a crayfish, the heart just washes the blood over the organs and it kind of comes back. But in us, it's all closed. And so the blood stays in the heart and vessels. And as we'll see, just the fluid and the good stuff comes out and, uh, and the waste and the carbon dioxide come back in. But it's always the blood is kept in these vessels. And in us, the blood is under pretty high pressure in our, uh, certainly in our arteries. Uh, maintained by that heart. So definition wise, arteries carry blood away from your heart. That's pretty much it. That's the definition. And uh, the your aorta is the biggest one that comes out of your, your heart. The left ventricle is huge vessel, uh, size of a quarter. And uh, from that, it branches and branches and branches, and the, the arteries get smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually, they get really small, and we call them arterioles. And uh, these are just before the capillaries. So you can see they lose all that muscular layer. It's just like a little bit of muscle left in the arterioles. And they're kind of the, the gatekeeper between uh, them and the capillaries. And that is where the action takes place. Your capillaries are narrow, just a thin wall, leaky in most cases. And uh, the blood at that point is just moving very slowly. An exchange can take place there. Your arteries and your veins are just highways to carry the blood. Your capillary beds, <clears throat> capillaries are where the blood is going slow enough for there can be exchange of oxygen and sugar and nutrients, everything. And the capillaries turn into venules. And again, these are, how do I say this? They are, um, it's a continuous kind of thing, you know? So uh, arterial gets smaller and then when it has no more smooth muscle, we call it a capillary. And then it gets a little bigger, maybe a little bit of muscle is a venule. And eventually the veins, <clears throat> they get bigger and bigger as more and more coalesce together to have the major veins in your body. Look at the back of your hand, you see veins running there, et cetera. So, um, and one thing about this is that veins will be on the surface of your body, your jugular, the veins you see. Uh, uh, especially if uh, you're slender without a fat, you can see veins popping out on your muscles, et cetera. Um, you won't see any arteries on the skin because uh, arteries are under high pressure. It'd be kind of dangerous to have an artery uh, close to the skin. So your artery, your carotids are deeper. You've got a jugular that's just beneath the skin. That's one other thing. And just basically when we get to naming them, we'll see arteries, you know, you've heard of your, your brachial artery, your, your radial artery, your femoral artery. Um, they don't usually have veins of the same name. So it'll be uh, uh, brachial veins, femoral veins, all these things like that. There's actually usually an artery. Here's an artery. And then uh, 
oh God, I picked the same color, but there's often a couple of veins uh, called companion veins that run with it of the same name. So I'm feeling my radial artery here at my wrist. There's radial veins right next to it. Yep. All right. And again, veins are going back towards the heart. They're all going back to the right atrium, really. And uh, all your arteries are going to come off the aorta. And this is big picture. I love it. Look at this thing. This is the schematic or the diagram of your cardiovascular system. And you see the heart is what generates the pressure to keep the blood moving. And that's the key. It's just that blood is going to move from higher to lower pressure. Just like you turn on the spigot on your hose, it's going to move. It's higher pressure to lower. And then higher pressure because you have a water tower somewhere in town where the water is held up high. And so the gravity is going to cause this pressure and the water is going to flow. Water is not going to flow uphill, right? So same thing here. You're generating this pressure in these, these ventricles where you, the muscles are going to contract it. And it's going to cause pressure to increase and the blood's going to be ejected out and you're going to feel that pulse. All right, so basically, when you take a look at this, uh, some things I want you to remember is I remember we have two circuits in the heart, right? On the right side, the blood is gonna go to the lungs. That's the pulmonary circuit. So it leaves the right ventricle to the lungs through pulmonary arteries. Pulmonary veins carry it to the left atria. It's come back to the heart having gotten oxygenated. Yeah, that's the pulmonary circuit. Now the left side, the left ventricle is the biggest, strongest chamber because that's pumping blood out your aorta. And that's going to your whole freaking body, right? Your toes, your tip of your head, everything, right? Yeah. And uh, if we take a look, let's let's just take a look here. You can see um, uh, uh, that uh, if you follow the aorta out of the body, this is diagrammatic, but you can see the heart. See the coronary arteries? The heart gets blood first. And so right off the aorta, there's coronary arteries that will wash the heart muscle and blood. And then all the cardiac veins will bring it back that coronary sinus back into that right atrium also once the blood is, has been finished. Do a little bit of review here. All right, so the aorta comes off your heart and it's carrying the highest pressure uh, blood in your body as it's just coming out of the heart and uh, it's gonna go north and south. And so there's branches of the aorta, they're gonna go up uh, your neck, your carotid arteries are deep in your neck. And that's going to serve your brain and your face and everything here, right? So big, important arteries here. And then subclavians will turn to brachial, go into your arms. So going north, uh, superior, I should really say, um, you're going to have arteries that go to the, the arms and then, of course, up your neck to your head. So that's the blood going upward like that. And it will all drain down eventually in your jugular veins, you've all heard of, and your jugular veins will drain into that superior vena cava back to the heart. All right, now most of the aorta arches down and it goes down your chest. And so it's gonna serve you know, between your ribs, all of your uh, intestines and stomach and liver, all things like that. And then that aorta is gonna split to go to the two legs. And you all know by the time it gets in the leg called femoral arteries. Then it'll go behind the knee, down your calf, under your foot to you know, serve your whole uh, legs with blood. And so uh, you can see that uh, yeah, to the pelvis and legs. Uh, you should know in this class, we'll get to it soon, is that renal means kidney. So your renal arteries go to the kidneys. And we're gonna see they get a lot of blood because it's filtering it. You can see it kind of has these two capillary beds. And so the blood is filtered and you take out all the wastes and you regulate how much calcium, magnesium, and everything like that. And then the blood is returned to the heart having been filtered by the kidneys. So renal arteries do that. The other thing you need to know in this class is hepatic means liver. Hepatitis is infection in your liver. And um, so the liver gets a hepatic artery. But the other cool thing here looking at it in big picture, and I'll talk more about it in the last lecture, is that uh, all the blood that goes to your intestines and your stomach, where it's going to absorb nutrients, the veins, instead of going right back to the heart, all the veins from your intestines and stomach go through the liver. So the liver can take care of toxins and sugar. That's called a hepatic portal vein. Portal, you know, hallway from one capillary bed to another. Yeah, big picture. And you can see the inferior vena cava will go in, up into your right, right atrium of your heart. So the inferior vena cava, superior vena cava from your arm and your arms and your head. You're gonna get in that right atrium. Your coronary sinus drains the heart. So your right atrium gets blood from 
your head and arms, then the rest of your body, and then the heart itself. And all the blood returns without much oxygen uh, to that right atrium. And that's where it's going to go to the lungs. It goes back to the left side. It's pumped out to the body. This all happens simultaneously. All right. And again, all these vessels you see are just highways. The only thing that really counts are these capillary beds. You see them? And the capillary beds are where exchange takes place. And your body's got them. You have all these capillary beds and your brain determines which ones are open and shut. All right? Eat a big meal, your gut capillaries, the sphincters relax, the blood rushes to your gut so you can absorb those nutrients. Then you go to work out after that and those uh, arteries uh, shut down and the ones to your muscles open up. And so more blood is taken to your muscles. So these vascular beds, these capillary beds um, are separate into regions and your mind autonomically or automatically shifts blood to where you need it. You go out in this cold night and the blood is shifted away from your skin into your core so you don't lose energy, right? But you go out on a hot day or you get all flush and the blood is opened up in the skin capillary beds. You get the idea. Your, your, your body is always uh, opening and closing capillary beds uh, depending on your needs. All right. So blood vessels themselves, they are you know, hollow tubes, just like the, uh, the piping in your house. And uh, the arteries, they're put red because uh, they're oxygenated blood. Most of the arteries um, is gonna be oxyhemoglobin instead of deoxyhemoglobin in the veins, they're kind of bluish. And again, there are superficial veins in your skin. There's no superficial arteries, they're all kept deeper. Yeah, they often have the same names. This is renal artery, renal vein. Femoral artery, femoral vein. See? And sometimes they're different. The artery, you're going to see these are carotid arteries going up to your neck. We call them jugular veins draining down. So but usually if there's an artery, there's a vein. Same name. All right, so looking at all of these arteries and veins and capillaries, they, they have the same, of course, basic construction. Right? They just vary on their needs. And all of them have these uh, layers. Well, you can see capillaries only have the inner layer. They got nothing else. They're naked, just the inner layer. We call them tunics. And a tunic is another name for a, a coat. So they have these three coats. And the names are not, not hard at all. You just have a, a, an inner lining, intima or interna, tunica, intima. And then media is in the middle. It's going to be muscle, smooth muscle. And then the adventitia is the connective tissue on the outside, or the externa. So tunica externa, media interna. How's that? And um, you can see the, the, the intima, or the inner layer is very is squamous cells, very smooth. It's a nice surface for blood and platelets, especially just to smoothly go on by. If it's rough, that's bad because it's going to cause turbulence and clotting and things like that. So you want nice and smooth. And then there'd be a little layer actually right underneath it uh, to give it some strength, some collagen elastic fibers around it. And as I talked about when blood clotting, remember I talked about is that when this layer is damaged, it's going to expose some of that collagen. And then the platelets will recognize that and begin the blood clotting process, right? Just reminding you of that. So this intima, and then there's some connective tissue. And then the media is smooth muscle. And so you have the ability to constrict that it's going to constrict the vessel or relax it. It's going to dilate the vessel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then finally, have a tissue is the connective tissue out there. So again, more elastic fibers. There'll be and big arteries. that will be fat. They'll actually be vasa vasorum. There'll be vessels to the vessels. If you're big enough, you need blood for those cells on the outside even. So yeah, and it's going to be usually, honestly, too, when you study that gross anatomy, you'll learn there's an artery and usually uh, veins with that, and then nerve too. Yeah, so you'll see artery, uh, nerve, artery, vein. So there's a femoral nerve, artery, vein, and they all run together, stuck together in a, in a bundle. <clears throat> this is stained for elastic fibers. So you can see our bigger arteries, like you know, you feel your pulse here, have all these dark purple squiggly lines. That's elastic fibers. It allows it to stretch. Oh. And that's so necessary when we do blood pressure, you're gonna see as the heart contracts and sends the blood out, those blood vessels stretch. And then when the heart's relaxing, it's like a rubber band, they release that energy and the heart beats again, they stretch again. 
So that stretchiness or elasticity, so, so important um, uh, to keep your blood pressure from just going way up and down and allow you to store that energy between uh, heartbeats. So cool. And this shows the three tunics. The intima is gonna be just a, a squamous cells there. The media is gonna be smooth muscle and uh, you can see all these elastic fibers. And the adventitia, you can see it's kind of messy. It's got fat and uh, fibers and nerves and blood vessels. All right, beautiful picture from your book. Uh, you take a look at it. And some differences are that arteries are under much greater pressure. That's the key, is that by the time the blood goes through the capillaries where it slows down, it loses all that blood pressure. And so the veins have, there's very little blood pressure to get that blood back to your heart. It's actually a problem to get that blood back to your heart because it's lost all that pressure going through all those capillaries. Um, so anatomically, uh, arteries would be thick walled. See that big media, lots of muscle. Whereas veins are wimpier, thinner walled. And uh, veins are usually uh, kind of larger diameter, but wimpy. The walls are very thin, uh, where arteries are more solid and round. They got more muscle around them because the pressure is much greater. And this also shows that some veins will have valves in them. So this keeps the blood moving in one direction. Uh, it's really important in your limbs, so like in your legs especially. So blood, the muscles will keep the blood moving up, but it can't go down because those valves shut when the blood tries to come back down. So it kind of keeps the blood moving back to your heart. So some veins have valves, no arteries have valves. And here's some, some pictures. And so you can see, you know, look at the difference here, an artery and a vein. The lumen is the means the middle. The lumen of your stomach is the middle of your stomach. The lumen of uh, or a vessel is just the, where the blood flows. And you can see the artery much thicker walled, right? Yeah. Oh my God, look at this artery. Look at how, how strong it is. And see the vein is really pretty wimpy, very thin walls. And you can see them running together, very, very common. And here, if you look at almost anywhere in the body, you'll see here's an artery. Look at that big, thick wall. And look at this vein. Look how thin the wall is in the vein. And it's kind of collapsed like that. Yeah. And um, for those in gross anatomy, uh, arteries will usually be hollow and white and solid. Veins often have clotted blood in them. Because when, when you embalm a body, you stick a high pressure embalming fluid, it goes through the arteries, then it perfuses the tissues and through the veins, and <clears throat> blood will usually clot and stay in those veins, uh, but they'll be washed out of the arteries. And then to be honest with you, like I said, here's some nerves too. And nerves, oh, I'm sorry, these nerves. Nerves will be solid, they're not hollow, right? Because these are just a collection of axons, right? Yeah, here, so here's nerve artery vein of some sort. And you can see adipose or fat tissue in here, connective tissue holding them together. So when you dissect a body, uh, you're gonna say, oh, here's a, the nerve artery vein. And the artery would be white and solid. And the vein will be dark and thin walled. All right, so angio uh, means blood vessel, angiogenesis, like Genesis in the Bible. Uh, uh, um, to bring about, to, 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 to grow. Yeah. The trouble with Genesis here. Not big on my Bible. Um, Genesis. Yeah, so angiogenesis is growing blood vessels, new blood vessels. And of course, you know, wicked important when you're developing, you know, as you're getting bigger, the vessels need to grow throughout your body so that every part of your, <clears throat> of your body has, uh, has blood supply, right? Now, what's, uh, what's given off here, and this is, I talked about this when uh, there was a blood damage, blood vessel damage and clotting and repair. He kind of repairs this. Uh, Vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF. And so it's really big if you get into this kind of thing, uh, like heart disease or cancer, uh, various drugs. Uh, this is gonna, um, this is a substance that promotes uh, blood vessel growth. All right, so the book has a little section on that, a little blue section on this, so you can read that. But uh, we really wanna promote angiogenesis, for instance, when you have a heart attack, you'll see. What happens is that part of your uh, heart muscle is gonna die from lack of blood flow. And so it's gonna give off this growth factor to try to encourage 
uh, blood vessels to grow to try to, uh, to, to, to save that tissue. And a lot of research goes into, can we inject or implant this growth factor to get more perfusion of the, um, of the heart muscle? I use the word perfusion. I didn't realize that. Just, that means how well uh, a tissue is, this blood supply, how well blood is going through it, meaning oxygen and glucose, things like that. So perfusion of a tissue. Uh, we look at it to make sure it's adequate for the uh, tissue to uh, be healthy. Now, this is interesting here. The second part about angiogenesis, the way we try to prevent it in some cases. So you want to encourage it if you want to encourage uh, blood vessel growth to make a healthy tissue. Yeah. And even normal exercising muscles, if you do aerobic exercise, you'll have angiogenesis where uh, more capillaries will grow in a muscle, providing more oxygen so it can be more aerobic. All right, the case where it's bad is cancer. And uh, <clears throat> in a tumor, these are cells that have, uh, are reproducing uncontrollably, they're damaged cells, and uh, they just, they're growing really quickly in this tumor. And now they have an issue, they have a problem, is that <clears throat> when you grow really big in a tumor, there's no blood vessels in there. So you're kind of starving yourself and it's kind of, it's halting the, uh, how fast the tumor can grow because of its lack of blood supply. So good cancers, good cancers, cancers that are successful, um, give off uh, angiogenic um, uh, chemicals that are gonna promote capillary growth, blood vessel growth to that tumor. And if that tumor has lots of blood, it can grow much more quickly. It's getting uh, nutrients and oxygen to it. So it's a huge factor looking at cancer drugs and cancer therapies is uh, can we find a way to starve the tumor from blood vessels? At least it'll make it grow a lot slower if it doesn't have all this blood going to it. Yeah. And so uh, yeah, your book talks about how um, Often if there's a major tumor and a whole bunch of smaller tumors, when you remove the big tumor, the other ones all of a sudden start growing. And it's thought that maybe the original tumor is slowing angiogenesis for the others. And so again, it's, it's complicated, but uh, so you wanna discourage angiogenesis uh, to tumors, to cancer, and you wanna encourage it to tissues where you want them to heal, you want more blood, like in heart attack. All right, then I'll show you some pictures. Just you guys, uh, we're, we're going to name these the major arteries. I talked about carotid artery and jugular veins. So we'll, we'll go through all the major ones in my last lecture. Uh, but here again is just the basic anatomy. You guys have learned you have an intima or interna, a media with smooth muscle, and then that external or adventitia, just kind of connective tissue. So they all have it. And you all know that arteries are thicker wall. They've got more uh, smooth muscle and veins are wimpier and sometimes bigger in diameter, but uh, very thin wall. All right. So here you go, arteries, thick, strong wall, lots of elastic fibers, lots of muscle, because damn, that pressure's high in there. They have to be able to withstand that and be able to stretch. Yep. And then as you go down, so the, the, we talk about big arteries being this muscular arteries, elastic arteries. There's some other terms we don't need to get into, but the arteries are the big ones. And then they start branching smaller and smaller and smaller and arterioles, or you get to the point where um, you have the inner lining and you have some smooth muscle, but not very much, all right? And capillary is where it's naked. You just have the endothelial lining. You don't have any smooth muscle, no connective tissue. So you go from thick to smaller and the walls get smaller to really tiny and just naked. And what, as we'll see also, as you go from one artery, it goes to, to hundreds of arterioles and thousands of capillaries. So as, as it gets smaller and smaller, but there's more and more of them, just to get that idea. So let's take a look, arterioles, uh, obviously thinner walls in an artery, but some smooth muscle, a little bit of connective tissue, and uh, the arterioles are gonna be what controls the blood to the capillary beds. Yeah. So look at this thing, just a little bit of smooth muscle. Look at that, just a little hint of it here or there. This ain't a capillary yet, because it has smooth muscle. It's got smooth muscle, it's still arterial. And finally, where the action takes place, we're going to talk about this in a little bit of detail here, because this is capillaries are where it's at here. <laughs> and uh, you can take a look here, you can see here's an arterial, and these little uh, smooth muscle can act as sphincters, and they can open or close capillary beds. Get in a hot tub, 
You want those sphincters to relax in your skin so your skin turns red. Then you go out in the cold, you want those capillary beds to close so the sphincters close and blood is shunted elsewhere. So yeah, and it's all done autonomically. You don't think about it. Yeah. Then you'll also see sometimes, look at these little arterial venous shunts. So let's say you want to shut down that capillary bed in your, in your skin because it's cold out. Um, what, what your body does is it, it shuts off all, all the extensions and it just has a shortcut. So the blood just goes right back to the veins and the skin is left with just a trickle of blood, but not very much. You get it? Capillary beds can be opened and closed. And sometimes there's these little shunts that just take the blood directly. And then if you close off the capillary beds, you just like make the blood go here. If you want the blood to go back to the capillary beds, you open up those shunts and the blood you know, travels in the skin and it does its thing. And what we have anatomically, just that endothelial inner lining, it's all you've got, no muscle, no connective tissue. And they're more or less permeable. Some capillaries are super leaky, big holes in them, in your spleen, your bone marrow, and your liver. And others, remember we talked about the blood-brain barrier in the brain? Yeah, there's a capillary that has an additional layer of neuroglial cells, astrocytes, that are covering the outside that really protects it. But yeah, take a look at this capillary, see how leaky it is. And we can look up close to this uh, electron micrograph and you can see there's a slit there. I mean, water can go right through. There's, they're not really connected. So um, capillaries can be quite leaky. And um, yeah, especially you can control this uh, with a histamine you know, chemicals. You can make it more leaky or less leaky, depending. Right? You got a splinter in your finger, that finger swells up, it's red, it's hot, it's painful. You've got those capillaries that are wide open and there's, those gaps are big and all this fluid is leaking. You have what's called edema. Edema is when fluid is in your tissues and it appears swollen. Yeah, and so um, uh, coming out of these slits uh, is water, uh, real small proteins and uh, sodium and calcium and all these things. Um, what doesn't go through there is blood cells. I mean, unless they're a white blood cell going somewhere purposely, it'll move out of there. But blood cells, the big proteins, albumin, fibrinogen, they're too big, they're not gonna move through. Things that are uh, lipid soluble, I mean, oxygen, carbon dioxide, they can just go right through there. Um, yeah, so some things stay in the blood and don't leave, like the big proteins in the blood cells. Um, and other things like the water and the gases, they can just diffuse out. Yeah, and so again, these terms, we hear vasoconstriction, the smooth muscle is gonna constrict. It's gonna narrow that artery and shut it down. The dilation is gonna dilate it. You're gonna make it bigger. And the blood flow is gonna be greater. There'll be less resistance and blood flow is greater. Yeah, cool. In a case of you know sympathetic nervous system, like if you're fight or flight, um, you'll see that um, uh, adrenaline will make the blood vessels to your gut <clears throat> shut down, and the blood vessels to your your brain and your muscles open up, so you're ready to fight or flight. All right, here's an important uh, uh, issue here. This is how um, in your capillary beds what's going on. So what's going on is at the arterial end when the blood is entering a capillary blood. It's under a lot of blood pressure, it's got the most blood pressure. And so we have this called the hydrostatic force is gonna filter the blood out. It's gonna, I'm sorry, blood, yeah, it's gonna filter the blood so water's gonna come out. So under high pressure, uh, the water is going to uh, be pushed out through these little slits everywhere. And osmosis will always be sucking water back in. So you have these two forces at once. There's a hydrostatic pressure pushing fluid out. And then because there's stuff in the blood, the water wants to be sucked back in by osmosis. But on the arterial end, the blood pressure is high enough. So there's a net outward movement of water. So water leaves the blood into the tissues and it washes over the cells and it delivers uh, glucose and oxygen, all these things, yeah. Now, as the blood moves through the capillary, this narrow tube, it loses that pressure. You can see it's just this friction of the fluid moving along this narrow tube. It's gonna lose all that blood pressure as it goes through. And so the other end, um, 
whereas uh, osmosis is pretty similar, but you've lost that hydrostatic pressure, you've lost that blood pressure. And now that osmosis that tends to suck water back in is gonna overwhelm that outward force of the blood pressure. And you have a net inward push, pull of water. Yeah, so water is forced out in the arterial end of the capillary bed. And then it's sucked back in by osmosis on the venous end, which is the, the end of the capillary bed. Uh, now, what do you guys notice about those numbers? It looks like outward pressure is 11, inner pressure is 8. Uh, the deal is you always lose some water. Not all the water comes back in. And that water is carried off by the lymphatic system, which I will tell you about next chapter. But it pretty much collects the extra water that's in the tissues, and it moves it back to the blood. And on the way, it gets filtered in your lymph nodes. And so it's a good story. All right, you guys got this? You've got opposing forces. The outward blood pressure force and the osmosis force where water is sucked back in because there's stuff in the blood. You know, and as you lose water, the blood itself gets thicker, right? It gets, there's more osmotic, it's called colloid osmotic pressure. There's more stuff in there. And so uh, the water is going to want to be come back in. And again, this is why it's important to be able to have those proteins. Remember albumins? is because that makes this osmosis possible. If you don't have many proteins in your blood, it could be a failing liver or deficiency in your diet. You don't have enough proteins, you're starving. Then the water leaves, but that osmosis is cut way back and more water stays in the tissues. You get edema, you get swelling, and it can go into your belly, like a sort of starving children or a, it's called ascites, where fluid gets into your peritoneal cavity in your abdomen. It's painful in this water. It just builds in there. And someone that has a lot of edema, sometimes their legs will be swollen out, their arms or yeah, their face. All right. And you know, histamine. Yeah, you've been taking antihistamines your whole life. And now you know histamines make uh, capillaries leakier. They, they can expand them, make those slits bigger. And so more water leaves. Yeah. And then again, these capillaries, some are really leaky and some are not as leaky. Um, the ones that are really leaky are called fenestrated, like a fenestra as a whole, they've got holes in them. And they kind of make the capillaries turn into these sinusoids or these little channels. They're just so leaky, like Swiss cheese. And uh, you'll see this in your spleen and your bone marrow when big things are coming in and out. You know, it's like it's very, very leaky and spongy like. But in your muscles and in your brain, etc., capillaries are somewhat leaky. So different kinds of capillaries depending on uh, your needs. All right. So capillary density. You know, how many capillaries do you have in a particular tissue? Right. give you the answer. It has to do with how needy that tissue is. How much oxygen, how much glucose does it need? How much waste does it have to be carried away? Yeah. And again, I talked about training. Aerobic training will increase capillary density in those muscles, especially slow twitch muscles in your calves and your legs. Uh, if you use it a lot, you can have more capillary density. You become adapted to being able to deliver more oxygen to those muscles. Yeah. yeah. And if you look at density of a, a a fish or a frog of capillaries in a mammal. Mammals have way more uh, capillaries. If you were to put our capillaries end to end, the book is talking about 25 to 60,000 miles of capillaries. Holy cow. So of course they're really tiny and they're like, like a web throughout our whole body. All right, so we've made it to arteries, arterioles. We saw what happened in the capillary. That's kind of critical. Remember arteries and veins, nothing happens. The, the blood's going somewhere, right? But the capillaries, there's this exchange and there's this osmosis and, and blood pressure. They're gonna balance the water so that the blood comes back to the heart with water in it. Yeah. So the other end are venules. So venule is a little vein. Again, they're small, uh, less muscle than a, a vein. And a vein, a vein will be, um, big in diameter, but relatively thin wall. But here you're gonna have, you definitely have some muscle connective tissue around it. Yep. And much lower pressure than the arteries. So they can be really thin walled, whereas an artery 
needs to be thick walled because it has to withstand the pressure. So here's a vein, thin wall, and here's an artery. See the wall difference, obviously. This is a nerve too, in case you care, they're running together. Oh yeah. Oh, some more pictures. I mean, histology, you look at this, you're like, oh, there's an artery and a vein. You can, you can tell. I can't snap it that much now. All right, what about these valves I'm talking about? Um, yeah, you don't see these in the arteries because the pressure is going to move the blood. But the blood has a hard time getting back from our limbs to our heart because there's very little pressure by the time you get there. Capillary beds just suck that pressure away. So the blood has a hard time getting back. And we'll talk about in a lecture of blood pressure what your body does to help return that blood back to your heart. <clears throat> well, one thing is the, the, the veins you have, especially in your legs, have these valves in them, one-way valves. And uh, the flaps are such that blood can go this way, no problem, but they shut when blood tries to come back down. So up, no problem, down, they shut. And so, um, yeah, and so it, it, it keeps the blood, if your muscles are contracting, it, it squeezes the blood and it has to kind of ratchets up. It can't go back down. It can only go up because these valves uh, prevent backflow. Yeah. And we see here uh, when you have issues like varicose veins, these valves can become incompetent where they don't meet anymore. And then the blood does start pooling and it will stretch those veins and they become uh, visible and painful. All right, this kind of blew my mind. I'll share with you guys when things are surprising to me. I thought, okay, if I ask you arteries and veins, you know, how much blood is in arteries and veins at any one time? You think, well, 50-50. No way. It turns out that most of your blood is in your veins. Your veins are, um, your arteries are, are, are smaller lumen and they're really muscular and high pressure. The blood's moving through that. By the time we get to the veins, they tend to pool up. And so a lot of your veins, your reservoir in your body is in your veins. And uh, it's getting back to your, it's all getting back to your heart and being pumped around. None of it's just staying there, but it's just, um, they get through the arteries kind of quickly and then they kind of, uh, they pull up in the veins more in your body. So looking at that, it's not that way at all. I can see your heart has about 7% of your blood at any one time, but, but basically uh, there's a lot more blood in your veins. And if you have a real issue, if you're bleeding, you're hemorrhaging, your body will, will squeeze that smooth muscle in the veins and that helps return that blood to circulation to help, help keep your blood pressure up. So your veins are a reservoir of your blood. They hold a lot <clears throat> and they can be squeezed to, to return that to keep your blood pressure high, as I said. Hey, I think this is the last slide. Indeed, so this lecture, covered a number of things, but basically it's the anatomy of arteries and veins, right? And uh, uh, we'll get to naming some of the major ones. Again, gross anatomy, you learn a whole uh, 10 times as many as I'm gonna teach you, but uh, we'll get the major ones down in this class and uh, that'll be good. All right, class, again, happy Valentine's Day. Hope you guys uh, are celebrating or not, so have a great, Sunday in any case, and uh, I'll see you all um, tomorrow or Wednesday. All right.